Welcome back to video three in our series on OWASP top 10 for 2017. And here we're looking at A3, which is sensitive data exposure or effectively seeing data in plain text that should normally be either hidden or encrypted. And this is our first climber. So A1 and A2 ha are unchanged in the list from 2013. But A3 used to be A6, so it's moved up three places. This has become the most common um, risk that's been seen in the wild in the last couple of years. And also there have been changes to the way that applications are developed. So we now have a lot of APIs, which mean that data that traditionally was hidden much deeper down is now perhaps under less layers of security. And also with single page applications and putting things like Angular and React directly into the browser have led to data that again traditionally been hidden behind a server page is now potentially a lot more vulnerable. So this is the OWASP grid for A3. It's generally relatively hard to detect data at rest being uh, either not carried out or carried out incorrectly. And it can be quite hard to exploit if we're talking about something like an SSL or a TLS setup not quite being done correctly. Trying to actually take advantage of that is not necessarily easy. And therefore, this is often done as a, a second level attack. But at the same time, data not being protected or encrypted is very common. And obviously, perhaps the technical impact is very high because most of the value on our web applications is in the data that they are supposed to protect. So if we can access that data, then clearly we have a big problem. So we're talking here really about data that has a high value to an attacker usually. So we're talking about credit card information, we're talking about credentials like email addresses and passwords. Obviously any kind of sensitive personal data has value to somebody, whether even if it's just the person that it relates to. So, of course, there are risks here for things like blackmail and extortion. So, you know, give, give me some money or I'm going to tell everybody what you know, what you've been up to on the Internet, that kind of thing. So browsing habits, which we wouldn't generally consider to be high value. But in many ways, if you are in a country that has a repressive government, then your, your browsing habits could very well land you up in prison or worse. But also, if you have slightly alternative tastes in what you do on the Internet, again, you don't necessarily want people to find out about that. So you don't want people uh, kind of extorting you or blackmailing you. And obvious kind of data like financial information clearly has high value. Now, in any scenario where this data is not correctly handled, by your application, then clearly data exposure is a serious risk. So it may be higher for some people than others. It may be higher for some applications than others. But at the end of the day, for the most part, we need to treat all the data that we store as potentially high value to somebody. There is a reputational risk to the actual owner of the web application as well as the direct risks of that data being used. So even if the data doesn't have any inherent value or certainly not a high inherent value, the actual reputational risk of a company that loses this can be significant if you are the owner of the web application. So you do need to be careful. The data can be directly vulnerable. So it can be vulnerable just because data that's not encrypted can be read directly usually through some other kind of attack, but it can also be exposed by other poor quality controls. So where we have controls in place already to ensure the protection of that data, things such as whether it's firewalls, whether it's the setup for our HTTPS, whether it's the choice of encryption, that in itself can cause the data to be exposed. So there are a number of different attack vectors to this as already mentioned, gaining access to this data is often secondary to another type of attack. So it isn't necessarily a bad thing that our data is not encrypted. But if we don't have another set of controls to help protect that, then clearly we're still going to suffer from sensitive data exposure. 
So in terms of commonality, evidence would suggest that very few apps have a pessimistic encryption policy. In other words, very few apps will store data encrypted by default. Most apps will take the view that we only store data encrypted when we know it's important data, and even then not always. But otherwise, we only encrypt stuff that we know we need to encrypt. Everything else is stored as plain text. The other issue in terms of how common this is, is encryption might be applied in some places, but not others. So, for example, we might kind of say, well, we've got full disk encryption and assuming that that is some kind of fix all solution without understanding that encryption needs to be applied at more than one level. And we've seen several times, in fact, some fairly high um, profile breaches. Some well-known companies have had date, data taken that implies that they're not even applying what the payment card industry require in a data security standard. So they might say certain pieces of data need to be encrypted using some kind of modern well-known encryption and certain other data should not be stored once it's been used. And we're seeing sites that are demonstrating that clearly they're not abiding by one or both of those requirements. So we know that this is, is fairly common. The other issue that we have now, the HTTPS in the last couple of years has taken quite a high profile in the news. People kind of saying you need to use it everywhere. And apart from a few people that would say, well, actually, I don't need to. I think in general, it's considered fairly good practice that all of your web applications should use HTTPS everywhere. The cost of doing it, the technical hurdles are lower than they've ever been. So although that can be a good thing, of course, the danger is if somebody finds a, an old article, a poor article that tells them how to do that and then they don't set that up correctly, then you could end up with potential risks in terms of people exploiting that, downgrading the HTTPS, potentially even breaking very old versions of Cypher suites that are no longer recommended. So there are potential dangers there. And attacking weak crypto, although that is a risk, that's much less of a risk than the data being accessed directly because attacking cryptography is relatively difficult if you know if you have any form of cryptography it's going to be difficult to attack that but clearly we kind of want the best of both worlds we should be considering that directly exposed data being protected using good quality encryption but then we should also consider these other controls we have like tls like others being also done properly so we have a two level kind of protection and thinking in terms of the the reputational risk i would much rather say well our systems were broken into but in fact that took a lot of work and all the attacker ended up with was a load more of encrypted data clearly that sounds much better than saying well we had this great firewall which got broken but now that they've broken that they've walked away with a load of plain data plain text data Clearly, that doesn't sound quite as good, doesn't make it sound like we know what we're doing. And as mentioned before, and it should be fairly obvious, the technical impact of exposing sensitive data is very severe. It's probably one of the worst, if not the worst, technical impact that exists. So I want to run through a few examples of areas in which you might kind of question, is this something that's relevant for you? Is this a mistake that you're already making? And these are just kind of headline things. I, I don't have any technical examples or any kind of web applications I can show you because most of these are understandable enough in a simple PowerPoint slide. So first example is data at rest. So we've got things like full disk encryption. You might have that switched on. It's relatively easy. Depending on the versions of operating system you have, it might or might not cost you very much money, but you pretty much flick a switch and it works invisibly. So that's great because it protects you against hardware theft. But what you should know, of course, is that it does not protect you against application vulnerabilities because the application still needs to use unencrypted data. That's kind of how the user is interacting with it. So encrypting data at rest is great for theft. It's not great for application vulnerabilities. Uh, another data at rest encryption example would be using database data encryption. 
So some of these database engines now have something they call transparent data encryption, TDE. And again, you pretty much flick a switch. The actual storage of the encryption keys, all the rest of it is mostly handled for you. And that's pretty cool. But again, it might protect you against hardware theft and it will protect you against some types of application vulnerabilities but it doesn't protect against all application vulnerabilities because while the application needs to use unencrypted data there is a way for the application to decrypt it which means there is a potential way an attacker could also decrypt it and of course it doesn't protect against the data in the browser if a user is looking at their decrypted data then again, it needs to be decrypted. There's a way an attacker might be able to do it as well. When we then look at things like data in transit, a very common example we've mentioned earlier is HTTPS. So depending on exactly what server you're running, what your kind of risk appetite is, whether you've got a connection to the public internet or the rest of it, it might not cost you very much. It might be easy to set up. It might be reasonably hard to set up. So there's a kind of a, a little bit of a of a caveat there. And as you probably know, it protects against eavesdropping. It protects in some cases against what you're looking at, what sites you're visiting and things like that. But again, doesn't protect you at all against application vulnerabilities. If an attacker finds a way to perform an injection attack, for example, or cross-site scripting attack, then HTTPS is not going to protect you against that. And it doesn't protect, in this case, against hardware theft. So you would need to use this in conjunction with some kind of data at rest encryption as well. Another example is a use or lack of use of key rotation. So if you're using symmetrical encryption, you're going to have some encryption key somewhere. You know, how does that actually get stored? Do you use default encryption keys or keys derived from default credentials? So I don't know if you've ever been there. I definitely have where I'm first learning about encryption, first learning about setting these things up. Sometimes as soon as I've got it working, I'm tempted just to leave it alone because I think, well, I've got it working now. I don't want to break anything. I don't want to stop it working. So I'm not necessarily massively tempted to go in and change an encryption key or to update it or to upgrade it. So there's a danger that once it was set up, you know, 10 years ago, it was using something that might have been OK then. But if that key's been compromised in the meantime, then my whole application is potentially compromised at some level. Questions to ask about your key management. Can you quickly disable a compromised key? So even if you're using encryption, if suddenly you think, oh, no, our application's been attacked, somebody might have stolen the key, how quickly can you disable that key without disabling your entire application at the same time? How do you re-encrypt data using your new key that you've just issued? You know, another issue which is quite a big deal in most cases is how easy can you replace old crypto with new crypto? So in the next example, we're going to look at Adobe. We're using something called triple des, which is pretty much considered old hat and you wouldn't use it on anything new for sure. But what if your application was written 10 years ago when triple des was kind of OK? Is there a way you can actually unplug the, the triple des and replace it with something like AES or something else. And in most cases, the answer is no, uh, or it would be very, very difficult to do it without a, an awful lot of work required of the developer, of the operations people to actually go in there, re-encrypt data, you know, find where it's being used even to replace it. It's, you know, it's going to be a bit of a problem. And the example here at the bottom was for a company that I used to work for we were facing these exact problems and we started by using OWASP's ESAPI, which was effectively a library that was designed to give you kind of enterprise security features. However, it basically is not really maintained anymore, which is a shame. And it was lacking some very, very fundamental features, one of which was the update of keys and the replacement of crypto. So it's all very well being able to just kind of encrypt something and get, say, an, an AES-256 blob of encrypted data. But what happens if some someone suddenly finds that AES-256 has a vulnerability? 
how do you actually deal with that? And the ES API didn't really have any way to, to cope with that scenario. And it also ended up saying, well, actually, a lot of this stuff's built into .NET. So in the C-sharp version of the library, we don't actually need half of these features that are in the ES API library. So you ended up with this kind of hodgepodge of different things. You ended up using some things out of .NET, some things out of ES API, and it lacked the features. So it ended up being um, kind of unusable. So we ended up developing our own encryption library. It's not completely finished. But the idea was by using the password hashing competition format for the data that we could actually mark the encrypted data to say we're using this algorithm, this key length, a reference to this encryption key. So then if we did need to rotate keys or rotate encryption, we could do it with full vis visibility of what's going on. So uh, something we might release into the community, but we're not quite there yet. So this is an example of how you could even use encryption and get it wrong. The Adobe breach was from 2013. So Adobe basically made the, the mistake of not encrypting everything. So that was their first mistake. The second mistake was using password encryption that did not use recommended practice, which would be a secure password hashing algorithm like Bcrypt, Scrypt, PBKDF2, Argon2, one of those four. They just used bog standard symmetrical encryption. And so the, the vulnerability here wasn't the need to obtain the encryption key because that wasn't needed in this case. The vulnerability was effectively an inference from the data that was stolen. So for an example, these are just obviously made up at the bottom, but let's say we find the data for user 123 and we see that their encrypted password is XXXXXX, right? That doesn't give us any information directly, but because the hint is recorded in the database table in plain text, they've told me that password is password. In other words, I now know what user 123's password is. So that gives me user 123's password. But even if user 321 has a good password hint, like my password is the one I use on my home computer, which doesn't tell us anything, because the encrypted password is also XXXXXX, I can now infer that user 321's password is also the word password. So I can cross-reference all of these different users in this table using password hints, using pa um, passwords that I've now discovered, and using the fact that the encrypted passwords would be the same if the passwords were the same, I've ended up with a massive set of data that I can pretty quickly work out what people's passwords are. If I happen to have an account on Adobe, I can then also use that as a way of actually working out uh, using a known plain text what someone else's password is. So there are lots of vulnerabilities in it, lots of problems, and this was kind of bad news for Adobe. This was pretty poor form, but it's also the reality of lots of companies who have lots of applications spread over many years and many locations. And a more up-to-date one is Equifax breach, which affected you know, up to, up to something like 146 million people. Now, a particularly galling problem, a particularly annoying problem with Equifax was that they have your data even though you don't give it to them because they get it from financial institutions. So you could have been affected even though you have no direct relationship with Equifax, and that was quite annoying. The initial vector was an unpatched web server, and it was an Apache Struts application. And despite the fact that the patch was available for two months, Equifax hadn't patched the web server in question, and they did actually know about the patch. And the problem is, though, of course, for Equifax, for many of us, how many unpatched applications do you have? Chances are you probably don't know. How many web applications do you have? How many web servers do you have? Again, in a company like Equifax, the answer is probably I don't know. How long realistically or how quickly realistically could you patch everything? The answer is probably don't know, but it's going to be a long time. So there was then a two-month um, lead time or a two-month delay between the attack actually starting against this unpatched web server and then the attack actually being detected. So although none of those things are particularly necessarily outrageous, really this was a combination of 
kind of perhaps uh, lack of visibility of patching, lack of network segmentation, which meant that the attack in one web server was able to access more than it should have been, and a lack of pessimistic encryption. So if all that data had been encrypted properly, then what the attacker would have been able to do would have been limited much more and the reputational damage to Equifax and their 18% drop in share price could have potentially been avoided. But actually, in this case, to give Equifax their due, even if encryption had been applied across all of the data that had been stolen, that might not have been enough by itself, because if the attacker was able to actually obtain those encryption keys or to use the mechanism that decrypts the data, they might still have got everything due to the problems with the unpatched web server and the lack of network segmentation. So encrypting data isn't always enough to protect you but in this case, a number of things were actually done badly. So in terms of how to fix it, we've got a number of things. You can take a considered view to data value. So protect the highest value data first. And in order to do that, you obviously need to know where your data is. Again, in a large organization, that's not as easy as it might sound because you might have hundreds of systems all from different eras, from different companies that have been bought out and integrated and everything else. Some of those might not even be changeable or modifiable because they were taken and frozen because they're so old. But if you can remove the data you don't need, if it's not there, then it's not vulnerable. Although obviously you need to consider backups because backups might have data that you have since removed from live systems. It's important that you learn about encryption so that you know how to apply it properly. And this is something that I think is massively lacking in the developer community. I think there are many developers, including web developers, who know virtually nothing about encryption. And to me, that is a massive problem. And as organizations, as the industry, we need to take that much more seriously. We need better training materials. We need to understand what encryption exists, what we can use, what's built into our web frameworks, what's available on operating systems, what is available in the industry. We can buy um, solutions if we need them, if there's nothing else we can do. But we need to learn what's out there. Encryption is generally fairly lightweight, so we should be using it by default. SSL encryption doesn't really add very much, or HTTPS, should I say, doesn't add very much work to a modern server, which probably has AES encryption in enabled by default anyway. Even transparent data encryption, full disk encryption, most of them not noticeable except in the highest level of usage. But then if we have an application that's used that heavily then that probably means we've got a lot of users, which probably means we should be taking this seriously anyway. So we should generally be using it. We need to consider all the different levels of encryption, which we'll have a quick look at on the next slide. And then it might be an obvious point to make, but we need to consider that if an attacker was able to gain encrypted data, it, would they automatically have access to the encryption keys? If they would, then we need to work out how to do that better. If we can store encryption keys in, in a way that's hidden, that's on a separate server, that's in a non-obvious place, then an attacker being able to exfiltrate an entire database doesn't necessarily get anything useful from that. We should also consider hardware protection of keys. A hardware security module might sound expensive, costing ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, but compared to the amount of money that some of these large corporations have had to spend in, in terms of tidying up and making things right again, $20,000 is pennies, really, to a company that's turning over hundreds of millions of dollars a year. We need to stop thinking in terms of price list mentality and start thinking in terms of the cost to the business of where we get this wrong. And if a hardware security module is going to help us achieve what we need to achieve and to achieve data that has no use to an attacker, then it's probably a small price to pay. We also need to be very careful where we get our advice from, and particularly when we're talking about kind of doing things for the first time, where we're talking about updating legacy applications, setting up HTTPS, putting in some kind of encryption library or choosing an AES in, um, you know, encryption level, setting up uh, VPNs and setting those up correctly is, is a right pain in the neck. Where are we going to get good advice from? 
how are we going to decide that this advice is neutral and isn't benefiting a particular vendor who wants us to use their solution? How do we know it's not old and out of date? How do we know this isn't just some 12 year old kid trying to be helpful, but basically giving you advice on how to do things exactly the wrong way? Again, we might need to spend money to get good um, independent advice on this, but that money is probably worth spending. And I just want to kind of take a you know a quick look at a number of different ways in which we might apply cryptography. We don't have time to go into all of them because every one of them is going to be different and is going to apply to your application in different levels and with different amounts of priority. We've already talked about full disk encryption. It kind of is it is what it sounds like. It's great for protecting against hardware theft, but because it's generally transparent, if an attacker comes in through a digital route, then it's not likely to present uh, a great protection from that. We then have just other data at rest protection. So using hashing of either passwords or of data generally, you don't just hash passwords. If you don't need to decrypt something, then you can use hashing. If you're hashing passwords, then you must be using, you know, the, the gang of four, bcrypt, descrypt, pbkdf2, or argon2, which are designed to be deliberately slow, or memory hard, or CPU hard, so that um, it takes an attacker much more effort to, to, to crack those things. Symmetrical encryption, just general, everyday encrypting data using a key. We then have TLS, so transport layer security, Often still referred to as SSL. It's going to take a long time for that to go away. But we're really talking about encrypting things over a TCP IP stack using a very well-known mechanism that's been tested you know, across many, many systems. So it's pretty trustworthy, but we need to make sure we configure it correctly. Then public key encryption. So where we have a mechanism where we have a, a theoretically independent web of trust. It's a little bit controversial, but do we trust people like Komodo and Thought and Symantec and all those other kinds of people to basically say, well, I, I'm going to verify that this key belongs to a certain person. Therefore, if I meet it in a browser session at a website, I know I can trust it. Obviously, it's not perfect, but it's probably better than nothing. PGP works on a slightly different ad hoc web of trust. So rather than trusting a vendor, I can trust somebody that I already trust to verify somebody else. Of course, there's an overhead in setting that up. If you don't know anything about PGP email, it's quite interesting. It can be used for other things as well. But there can be a, an overhead of adoption. It certainly can't work in completely public environments where most people will not be part of a web of trust. If you can fix that, then you'll probably make a load of money. Then there are other interact communications. So we need to remember that not all communications are based on TCP IP, which means they can't all use TLS out of the box. So things like Java remote method invocation, whether it's still a thing or not, it still exists. DCOM, SOAP, RPC, many of these mechanisms, they're designed for remote control. They're not necessarily based on TCP IP. So you need to understand how you set those up securely, how you use encryption on those. And if you can't use encryption on those, a question of whether you should still be using them or whether you need to apply other controls like segmentation, like firewalling them, like keeping them on separate subdomains and separate VNets, whatever it is to keep them away from prying eyes. Database connections might be based on TCP IP. They might not. If they're not, you might need to read up on how to secure those correctly. But then thinking of things like encryption of configurations. So, for example, certainly on older .NET applications, you had the ability to encrypt configuration using PKCS12. In other words, using an SSL certificate to encrypt the configuration so that theoretically the configuration can only be read or decrypted on the machine that has access to that X509 certificate. Now, arguably, an attacker would be able to do that using certain attack vectors, because if the application can do it, remember, an attacker can do it. But it does mean that if somebody gets simple access to a file system, then there is a chance that they can't read the contents of the configuration, which, of course, might include encryption keys, might include database connection strings and the like. 
And then a slightly newer um, consideration, I guess, certainly for you guys that are using cloud applications, is that people like AWS and Azure and Rackspace and, and Google and others provide their own kind of productized mechanisms for protection. And the ones I'm most familiar with are on Azure. So they provide things like a cloud security module. And it's not as quite as fully functional as your own hardware security module. And there is a not insignificant cost to using the hardware backed versions of it. But they do have software versions, which, again, you've got to be careful. You've got to really think about what you're doing, because if the application can decrypt something, then so can an, an attacker but it might give you protection against people stealing encryption keys. Um, you know, if the uh, security module on the cloud only really gives you a way of securing your keys, but you end up getting the key back to the application, then are you really actually protecting anything? If the key is exposable or obtainable, then it's vulnerable. So you've got to understand how to use it. But one of the features I think is quite cool on the newer versions of particularly the Azure um, cloud, I can't remember what they call it, sorry, the um, key management system, then you can lock down access to it to an application rather than a user. So that can be really cool because it can it can basically say words to the effect of only the application has permission to come and get this key out. So an attacker breaking into your cloud account can't get the key, even though the application can. So there are ways that you can lock those things down. They can be pretty cool. And there are various other encryption primitives that you can use on the cloud as well. You obviously have to trust your cloud vendor to do them properly. But I think it would be safe to say that their security experts probably know more than I do. So I would probably trust them. And a way of kind of really considering these things. This is just one example called Stride. There are others that are, you know, form other sorts of acronyms. But a way of really asking the question of every security boundary of your, your entire application infrastructure, the way it's hosted, where the data flows to and from, database, operating system, browser, all the rest of it, is to ask these questions of the encryption that you're using at different points uh, in at different points at different locations. So is it spoofable? So if I don't use the correct encryption, somebody can spoof either an event, you know, a message, a request, or the data itself. So can it be tampered with? Now that tampering might result in uh, a corruption, but if an attacker can tamper with something that can achieve an advantage to them, whether it's denial of service type tampering or tampering to try and, you know, try and transfer more money than a system thinks I've got in my account, those sorts of things, then there's a problem. Repudiation is about either an attacker um, making a request on behalf of somebody else, so saying that Luke made this bank transfer even though it was an attacker, but it's also, you know, Luke making a transfer and then claiming that they didn't. So can I actually make a request that's not bona fide and then deny all knowledge of it? Disclosure is kind of what we're mostly talking about here. So just directly disclosing our information. Denial of service is what it sounds like making a system unavailable, either just by overloading it generally or making something fall over at another level so it can't serve leg legitimate requests. And elevation of privilege is basically breaking something in a way that says, well, I can pretend to be somebody else because you haven't encrypted your data or haven't protected it in a suitable way. So a number of ways of kind of thinking about that. And, you know, that's kind of another whole video, really. But just in terms of threat modeling generally, there are many ways to do it. There are many tools available. One of them that used to be available, I haven't looked recently, was the Microsoft SDL tool tool. And it's based on Visio, so it's pretty much a drag and drop drawing boxes, drawing the boundaries, drawing where data flows between them. And then you can kind of click a button and it generates you a big list of threats. And then you can go through with the stride acronym for each one and say, how do I protect this from spoofing? How do I protect against tampering? And, you know, in, in some cases you might say I use TLS and that protects me against all of them. But of course, if it's a link that doesn't have the ability to use TLS, I might say, oh, actually, I can protect against, say, information disclosure, 
but protecting against tampering is actually really difficult. So I need to potentially mitigate against that. And threat modeling is something that us developers don't find very fun. But actually, from a security engineering point of view, it's really useful just to know where your risks are. Even if you do nothing with them, to know that your major risks are there, you might say, well, we can't afford to fix them now, but we can go to management and say, look, these are the four things that are the most serious that we aren't mitigating. And that might mean that management say, then we need to outsource that part of the system or we need to get in a consultant to help with that part of the system. Or they might even say that's an acceptable risk because if the risk is from somebody cracking you know, HTTPS, we might say that's not going to happen anytime soon. We can live with it. And particularly if you're a supplier to risk averse customers, that's government, that's healthcare, that's military, all of those kind of environments, then just to have the documentation and say, actually, we've done this. Here's the document. We printed it all out. There's all the answers to it. And not doing that in a way that you just want to tick a box, but doing that in a way that gives you confidence to go to your customers and say, yes, actually, we have thought of these threats. We have considered them. They are all the answers. And if you want one of those mitigations to be done better, give us some more money and we'll do it. So that's pretty cool. And so really, in conclusion, if I could sum up everything I've just said, in four points i'd say consider the value of your data because that's really going to drive where you need to protect it the most learn about encryption if you don't already at different levels let your developers learn about it let your security experts learn about it let your managers learn what they need to know about it and then do it correctly in lots of different ways and then really as any kind of good security management process involves a process that you can improve on so not just something you pull off the internet and just use even if it doesn't work we're talking about a living breathing process that you can say this bit works this bit doesn't let's remove it let's change it and that what that process gives you is the consistency to know that when you do add new applications, you add new modules, you add new technologies, you add new frameworks, you add new patterns, that all of those then f fit in with the process in some way to say, actually, although we're doing this differently, we're still going to apply that encryption. We're still going to apply that check so that we can make sure that we're not going to create holes and problems for the future as we move along. And then, of course, if something comes along that doesn't fit the process, then maybe you add another step, you change it so that, um, you know, your, your security level doesn't dip down too far. Thank you very much. Please read the top 10 publication. The link at the bottom is the actual English version of the PDF. It's not a very nice URL, I'm afraid. But if you search for OWASP top 10, you will find it very easily. Have a read of it. There's more information in there than there is in this document. And any questions or comments below. And otherwise, I will see you in the next video.